no budget. She also stated that shots for RSV will soon be available and a new booster shot for COVID will be available in September. With there being no further business, the meeting was adjourned. Repeat that again, I can hear you. Okay, um, you heard the minutes. We don't have enough uh, on a farm to vote on. So I just want you to know that the minutes have been read. Uh, if anyone knows of anything that needs to be corrected at that time, please let me know so we can get them corrected. And then once we get the quorum, we will vote on uh, on the minutes. Okay, with that being said, um, we're going to move on to our reports. Uh, Ms. Ms. Hill, Ms. Mavis, can you give us uh, our financial report at this time? Yes. Um, how detailed do you want it? Uh, do you want just the balance that we have, or do you want to discuss what we spent for the banquet and all of that? Uh, do it all with the banquet and everything. Okay, okay. We had a uh, beginning reconciled balance of $8,500.39, and that is on April, 20, April 22, April 22nd. Okay, checks were written out. Uh, Ms. Taylor Matthews speech for a uh, workshop uh, to Ms. Betty Selby, which was for $100 security deposit to secure the date with the cable. Uh, special occasions, the banquet, uh, one half was 1267.5. WC Chance Alumni was $200. Uh, Rashad Daniels was 204.54. Sandra McCleary was $200. Um, special occasions got the second half on August 19th of 1367.25. And then there was a check written to Wesley Stokes for 397.24 for the plaques. And so that gave a grand total of what was paid out that day of those amounts I just read of $3,903.04. We still owe Mr. Moses Matthews $36, which is makes it a total of $3,939.54. We also collected that day, we collected a total of um, we collected a total of $485 in checks. And we also collected cash of five hundred and thirty-six dollars. That was the five hundred thirty-six dollars. Excuse me, five hundred twenty dollars in cash that was raffle tickets that was collected at the door for the event, which was also paid out to. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Matthews. That was paid out to Miss uh, McCleary. So at the present, we have, there was also a check with Mr. Mavis Hill that purchased a sympathy flop with Mr. Carl Bond in the total of one hundred seven ninety six, And the ending balance as of today is $6,214.56. And then we have to take out uh, the thirty-six dollars that paid to Mr. Matthews, so uh, that went to McCleary. It was supposed to be a total of six hundred, and we were short. So once that that's paid out to him, 
the balance in the bank will be $6,178.21 with two deposits totaling $485 and $1175. Um, the $1175 consisted of $300 in county due, $525 in checks for tickets, and $350 cash in tickets. So, grand total, $6,178.21 once Mr. Matthews gets his reimbursement check of $36,000. And I did send you a copy of that report, Mr. Bob. Thank you. Okay. I think I have a question. Yes, I turned in $34 tonight for the uh, Okay. Did you get the $34 yeah. that... Yeah. Yes, I do have that. That actually, that actually went to a part of paying out um, to Miss uh, McCleary that we need to pay off for the setup and breakdown of the bank. So yes, ma'am, yeah. I do have that noted. We got that noted. So. Okay, all the and animals. Like that meeting, everyone can get a copy and they can see. Um, exactly what we paid out and how much tax was taken in. Okay, well, we'll do that at our next meeting. Um, we'll be sure that all members get a copy of the financial statement so you can see it in hand. Okay, are there any more questions about our financing at this point in time? Okay, so the financing report has been uh, accepted for filing and um, for filing because we don't have to approve the financial we just have to note it for filing all in favor of the um, motion to can i have a motion to file the financial report as been presented by uh, miss here yes ma'am so i uh, moved by miss joyce gray okay it's been moved by miss joyce gray do i have a second Second. And been second by Mr. Matthew uh, that we accept the report coming from our treasurer as she was presented. Are there any questions? Not hearing any. Can I get a, uh, everybody to say aye if you approve? Aye. All opposed, likewise. So it's been eyes have it, so this file, this report will be filed and put in on records. Okay, at this time, uh, values committee is not here right at the time. It's uh, to speak on that. Um, is uh, Secretary Brian, are you on online? Secretary Bryant. I'm trying to see, but I don't think I see her. I don't think she's on it yet. Okay. Um, since I have Jeremy back, Jeremy, can you talk a little bit about the values that you and the committee have been discussing at this time? Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Jeremy Collins, Martin County, uh, Providence, Omnistructure, Black Acre. Welcome. Uh, and I'll give an update. We, we met a couple of Wednesdays ago and discussed essentially a an updated timeline for how we would um, roll out these values, but also how we would engage communities across each one of the uh, each one of our member counties. Uh, if you remember before, we talked about maybe a two month uh, uh, window to get this thing uh, polished up and and, and, and and presented to the group. And what we've done now is kind of taken a step back, looked at a more inclusive way of including uh, not only more members from, from uh, various counties, but also a more diverse 
a cross section of our community. So younger folks and, and, and school age children, uh, more women, uh, more people who are from some of our non-traditional parts of the community. And we're looking at getting that squared away and presentable uh, by um, by March of next year. So that it'll be uh, ready and it'll be in folks' hands before the primary elections uh, for next year. So, so our update is really a full circle process uh, for, for getting our values together and also our report card, uh, uh, something that we can have in hand to grade our elected officials or our candidates by and then getting that out to the community, uh, ready, published out to the community before March so that it's ready before the, uh, the, the um, primary election of 2024. That, that's my report. Okay. Uh, you've heard the report coming from uh, our call chairman. Are there any questions for the value committee? Okay. Seems like everybody is, is, is on board with what you said. Uh, Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Mr. Collins, thank you for your report. At this time, at this time, I think we, uh, Mr. Marcus Bass from Alliance Carolina, if you will come forward with your report, who is also the executive director. So, Mr. Bass, it's in your, in your hand at this time. And his trainee. Yeah, and a little trainee. Yeah. Uh, okay. So it's just taking a few minutes uh, for them to get everything together. And so uh, we have the mayor of Williamson here, uh, Mayor Burns, if you would like to say anything while we wait and welcome us to your to your city. Uh, we would like to have that at this time. Since you said the word welcome, I do welcome you to the city of And the other thing I would have to say is I'm just so glad to give the number one more time. Thank you. Yeah, we're all blessed. <laughs> So at this time, we do have a quorum, and uh, you've heard the minutes from our last meeting that was read by Brother Matthews. Um, so now we can, can I have a motion to accept the minute that has been presented by Mr. Matthews? Um, I'm motion to accept the minute that has been presented by Mr. Matthews. Is it? Okay, it's been popular motion in second that we accept the minutes has been read by Mr. Matthew with any necessary corrections. Are there any questions? By not hearing any, all in favor of the motion, let, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, mm -hmm. like aye. Yes. Yes. Who, who's speaking? Okay, all opposed, say no, nay. Eyes have it, so the minutes have been approved from our last week. Thank you all. Can I 
I use that microphone in the chair, you won't be able to see it. I don't, I don't need to, I don't need to. Yeah, you can use them. You can use this mic. All right. I want to say good morning to everybody. I want to make sure I'm in the, the right um, space for our You're need to sit technology. Down. So I may have to. And just, I can take the laptop from here since the wireless. And I do have my assistant here to make sure I'm giving you the correct information. Now he's going to give me a grade whenever I leave from here. So along with him and Miss Betty, they kind of keep me in line. I want to say good morning to the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group. Good morning to the leadership here. Uh, I'm excited to share with you uh, just a few updates uh, on behalf of the North Carolina Black Alliance in Advanced Carolina. Um, for those of you that may not be familiar with me, my name is Marcus Bass. Uh, for a number of years, I've seen so many of you virtually uh, that it is a pleasure to be here in person. Um, I also want to greet your chair, uh, Chairman Stokes. I understand that he is not here today. He had another uh, event to attend, and I understand fully the power and importance of this convening. And I don't count it robbery at all that I woke up this morning excited about coming to Eastern North Carolina, excited to be in Williamson, and excited to be here in this facility. Um, what we're seeing take place in this city, the revitalization of this corner, is not just significant to Martin County, not just significant to the Civic Group, but it's significant to building black power. It's significant to us having infrastructure in places where we haven't had a chance to have this voice and the information I'm going to share with you today. Share with you today. Let's see here. Let's see here. So the information I'm going to share with you today is just a legislative update. Things are happening in Raleigh every single day that are impacting the way of life for residents across the city. And I think it's important for us to have these snapshots. A lot of times, um, Secretary Bryant will be giving a legislative update of sorts. And in our case, um, we provide policy updates across the board uh, for various organizations across the state. So the things that you're going to see here, I can share with uh, leadership so you'll get copies of it. But it really is to help us um, get a sense of what is taking place and how we can prepare for the road ahead in, regard, in regards to the General Assembly. Now, the first couple of updates I'm going to give you really kind of slide through where we have been over the summer in the General Assembly. And you'll see on the slides for the online participants, you should be able to see the slides as well. These Senate bills are one of the bigger pieces of legislation that's moving. There's some that's going to be about regulation, some that's going to be about some environmental and voting rights changes, and then we're going to get into the state budget. All right, this first uh, Senate bill update is for Senate Bill 747. And this bill is similar to uh, a number of bills that we've seen across the state in our history that more recently are changing the way elections are administered in North Carolina. There are some impacts that we're seeing in this piece of legislation that is currently on the governor's desk that will reduce access to absentee mail-in voting. It will gut same-day registration. So those of us that remember going in and registering and voting on same day, there are some regulations there that is going to change that early vote process to where you can still go in and register, but it is not considered early voting anymore. It is just voting in general. And a lot of this language is already in the law. So it, on face value, it looks like, you know, they're just cleaning up some language or, or laws or legislation in voting rights. But in reality, these guts, these potential uh, criminalization of election workers, if they're charged with any kind of citing of, of what could be defined as improper action at the polls, uh, also supporting the voter, it supports the voter fraud narrative. This notion that individuals are coming in and doing misdeeds at the polls, we know it's a false narrative. We know in general that the majority of residents in North Carolina that are going in and casting their ballot are able to do so freely without any type of impediment outside of the racial impediment that they're facing by folks in community. But this aspect of this assumption of voter fraud that's being perpetuated by Republicans in the General Assembly is now creating this SB 747, which is on face an update, but it's not really an update. So these uh, changes to early voting, 
we used to have at least 21 days of early voting across North Carolina. In total, about three weeks. Now we're down to seven days in some cases in certain areas. In most cases, we're used to two weekends of Sunday voting, Saturday voting. These changes that are going to reduce not just the early voting weekdays, but also going to reduce the number of weekends that we'll have to have access to the vote as well. Uh, there is one thing in particular. Has anybody in here registered and voted by via mail? Have you ever had to vote from mail using you know the mail process, or has everybody here voted early in person? How many folks vote in person at the Board of Election site? How many people know folks that have to vote by mail? Have you ever assisted anybody that's had to vote by mail? In some cases, we may want to look at how we are taking care of individuals that are in senior residence homes, individuals that are senior citizens that can still vote but don't have access to get to the polling site. There are changes in the laws that will make a signature match uh, process a little bit more difficult. Uh, in your On your ID, you have a signature verification. You have you sign your photo ID, and a lot of times they match that signature verification with the signature that is on these ballots, these mail-in ballots. And if we're not careful, they're going to say the signature that you wrote on your ID 10 years ago or 20 years ago, 30 years ago, doesn't match your signature right now in this day and time. So for individuals that are voting by mail, the signature matching process is something that we're watching and we're following in the General Assembly. But Senate Bill 747 is one of the biggest threats to our voting laws because it makes a lot of changes that are unnecessary. Uh, I'm going to move forward here to other elements of 747. It preserves same-day registration. Like I said earlier, it makes it seem as if it's changing the laws around early voting, but in reality it's keeping things in place but just changing the name of early voting to in-person voting. Uh, also, uh, the signature verification will be a part of the process that we'll have to figure out in this year as a pilot. Because in 2024, the state is going to implement it in each and every single election. Um, many of you know that there is an election in North Carolina this year, but every city and every county may not have an election per se. So for those of us that are wondering, is there an election in our area, I'm going to share with you a website so you can determine exactly whether or not there's an election in your town or in your city. Also here it says incorporates poll observer language in um, another bill that we'll see 772. They are now making it to where individuals that are working at the polls can actually have somebody come in and observe you. So if you've ever worked the polls, just say this is a polling location. For instance, there's a chief judge. The chief judge oversees the election. Usually the Democrats and Republicans that have a poll worker. Now they're saying that each group will be able to bring in three observers. Three observers that can stay in the whole entire time. And their main purpose is... It's supposed to be overseeing the election to make sure that the other side doesn't have a fair advantage. Now, what we're finding that they're doing is they're going in there and they're saying, oh, Mr. Matthews, I hadn't seen you voting in this location in a long time. You sure you still live over here? And they'll challenge your residency. Now, you know where you live. You know where you voted. Say, for instance, it's not during this early voting period. It may be on Election Day. They may try to say that we are bringing in people to the polls that are not supposed to be there, causing more problems than what the process allows. If there's a voter that is not supposed to be voting at a polling location, the system is going to kick that vote out. There's no question about it. And they've done it before. Time and time again, if somebody's at the wrong location, whenever you come in and come to the table to verify who you are, they'll let you know you're not at the right location. So to have this process where individuals can go in and observe, we got to watch that process very carefully. Now, here's another thing I'm going to say. We know the party in power in North Carolina in the General Assembly, the Republican Party, they have an advantage because they're able to put more observers at these polling sites than the Democrats are. A lot of times when it's time to work the polls, it's hard enough to get people to stand outside and help support the effort, let alone go inside. And so we have to be very careful that even though the law is going to allow equal numbers from the same party to come in and, and observe, if we don't have the numbers, the black community, not Democrats or Republicans, if we don't have the numbers of folks inside the building, individuals that are not wanting to make sure we vote or trying to keep us from voting are going to try to pick us apart on the inside around that process. And so this uh, 747 is a bill that we're watching and tracking just to make sure that there's no impediments at the polls for individuals that may not be aware of the laws. Did I get cut off here on, my, on the, um, the, the, let me see if my Wi-Fi is, 
the signal may not have um may have picked me up this time. See if it'll bring me back in. This shouldn't take but a second. All right, so it should be letting me back in the zone, and I'm just gonna bring this presentation back up. All right. So moving from so Senate, moving from moving from Senate Bill seven forty seven, I'm gonna go into the next update of the veto overrides. Now, because of a flip in the General Assembly, we had one individual named Trisha Cotham that folks remember at the beginning of the summer changed her party affiliation from Democrat to Republican. That switch was significant because before she switched, the governor still had the power to override any changes that were made in the General Assembly. So if a bad bill came into effect that the Republicans were just trying to push down the pipe, the governor had the power of the veto because we had one more House representative in power to sustain that veto. That Democrat flipped affiliation living in Charlotte, right outside of Charlotte, in the Mint Hill Matthews area. Her district now has a Republican representative. When they voted for her, she was a Democrat. Now she's a Republican. That stripped away the governor's power to have the power of the pen or the power to veto. And these are a few bills that the governor has already seen his veto being overridden. Uh, the first is House Bill 219. This House bill makes various changes to laws affecting charter schools. Now, we know in certain areas of the state that charter schools are taking over where public schools once thrived. And there are various reasons why charter schools, in some cases, aren't always necessarily a bad, bad thing. What is a bad thing is if a charter school comes into our community and takes dollars away from public schools. Uh, when we think about the number of uh, teachers, just in Wake County alone, where I just came from, there's over 600 teacher vacancies in the public schools. And every single year, they're cutting the number of dollars that are going into these public schools and moving into these charter schools. Now, how many people think that they are funding the private black charter schools at the same rate that they're funding the private white charter schools? They're not. As a matter of fact, a lot of you remember in the 60s when these schools started coming up, these Christian academies and these other areas, this is where they saw that everybody was going to be integrated in these public schools, so they made their own separate schools, and now they're trying to make the state pay for them. This bill, now that it is going into effect, it is going to loosen the regulations around charter schools. Right now, if a public school is underperforming, the state can come in and do things to make sure that school is performing right. They can provide more programs for them. With this bill taking effect, charter schools will not have any of that accountability. They'll get state dollars, but they won't have any of the same types of regulation as public schools. This bill also allows expansion without permission. Right now, there's only a certain number of charter schools that can be created in North Carolina each and every single year. If this bill takes effect, anybody can start a charter school without very little oversight. Now, it doesn't mean you can just step up tomorrow and open up a school, but it does loosen the regulations for how schools can be created. It will allow for preferential treatment to applicants. There was a time where anybody that applied to a charter school could attend a charter school. And that was one of the ways where they were able to get our dollars, our state tax dollars, into those public schools. They would say, well, we're open for everybody. Now the rules are changing where the same little voucher that they would once say was able for any student to use to go into these schools, they're not going to accept the voucher for every student. They're going to be able to deny certain students. Black students. Blacks, there we go, Ms. Betty. Black students. House Bill 219 also talks about allowing for the admission of foreign exchange students and out-of-state students. Anytime you allow a student in from out of state or out of the country, they're competing for a seat that one of our students can have at these schools. 
and allow for funds to be shared from public school funding, sales tax, federal funding. So it opens the opportunity for these charter schools to take more money from our public schools. Again, I know some of our um, churches are having these charter schools. That's a horse of a different color when we're talking about these large preparatory academies and these larger schools across the state that are really segregated in every way, shape, or form that you can imagine. House Bill 618 also talks about charter schools. Uh, this converts the charter school advisory board into a charter schools review board. That shifts the authority of those schools from the state to this review board without any type of appeal from the state board of education. Right now, the state board of education has some oversight in these charter schools, but if they create this new charter school advisory board or charter school review board, We'll have two state boards, one for private schools and one for the, or one for these charter schools and one for public schools. And again, additional boards, additional funding, that's money that, is, that those are dollars that are being diverted from our public institutions. Senate Bill 49 establishes a bill of rights for parents regarding the children's education, health, privacy, and safety. I'm going to say this. The state of North Carolina and our founders knew that parents had a uh, a very important job to be a parent. And they also knew that the role of a teacher is a little bit different. If you allow parents to interfere with each and every single thing that is happening in these classrooms, we would not see the equity that we see in public schools today. Imagine if we would have had a parent's bill of rights during uh, integration. The white parents would have done more than just have their students harass the black kids that were walking into these public schools. They would have kept them out at all costs. They would have told the teachers, don't teach the black kids in, my, in the classroom. This parent bill of rights seems to be a bill of rights that is pro-parents, but it really is another way for parents, these same parents that, I don't know if you remember last year, were going into these school board meetings and talking about taking the masks off and going into these school board meetings talking about my kids shouldn't be reading these books. Now these parents have created a bill of rights that will give them ultimate control over what happens in those schools. Not only that, um, I'm, I'm going to tell it like this, and I know nobody ain't hit this. There was a time period where if your parents put on something for you to wear that you didn't like, you would maybe pack your miniskirt in your bag or pack your shorts in your bag or somebody like and take it to school. You know, you're kind of the way to express yourself. You weren't trying to, you know, do anything out of the ordinary, but you wanted to be in your own character. Now, I know all of you probably wore exactly what you brought to school. You didn't change up at all. But there are levels of engagement that we have in our schools. A lot of times schools are safe places for some of these students that are in abusive home situations. Uh, there are safe havens for folks that don't have um, certain things that other children have. They can freely talk to their teachers about some of these circumstances. They are trying to make it seem as if the schools are safe havens, havens for students to be um, pulled into an alternative lifestyle, and that's not the case at all. We've looked in these schools, and there's nobody in here perpetuating to these students that you have to be anybody other than, you, than who you are. But these same parents that are talking about these mask mandates and are talking about changing the curriculum, they're also making it seem as if public schools are making students gay. I'm going to just call it like it is, Ms. Betty. That's right. They're trying to make it seem as if these public schools are teaching our students how to have these alternative lifestyles, and that's what they're using to funnel in this parent bill of rights. Now, I'm not going to ask anybody about what anybody does when they leave out of the civic group meeting because it's not my business, but I do know how we all take care of our ch children and provide for our children. It's up to the parents. That's right. When they're in school, there's a way that the school handles those situations, and there's a parent right to have a conversation about what's going on but for the parent to come in and want to alter what's happening in that school system because they something they saw on fox news it's ridiculous and so we need to cut that at the head before it even gets out there that they are trying to teach our students how to be gay or anything otherwise because those same that same ideology about why we can't have the students learn about alternative lifestyles is what they're going to say about race we can't teach you what black students went through because that's not the situation that we're in right now. So they're really trying to make it to where if they can get in here under this guise of gender politics, then they can change how you talk about race. And so we're not going to allow them to come in and just change our curriculum because it's not the black parent bill of rights. It says bill of rights, but we know exactly who these bills of rights are protecting. But we have to show up. But we do have to show up. 
this Bill of Rights, what makes this so ridiculous, and you'll see in this article, the state superintendent of public schools is now telling the General Assembly that they need more time to enact this bill. The governor tried to override it because he knew it was ridiculous. The General Assembly blocked his veto. Now, here we are, the state superintendent is saying, we don't even know how to implement this bill. The school districts are nervous because they know that parents are going to storm in, you know, the very next week they implement this bill, trying to change up the curriculum and how they teach in public schools. And so when you have, and this is a Republican too, the state superintendent is a Republican. And even she is saying that the Republican General Assembly is, is in certain legislation in our schools, and we don't even know how to administer it. So you know when they're calling foul on their own playbooks, you know something is going on here. I'm getting close uh, to the last two uh, slides here. These talk specifically more around some of these provisions or, or banning transgender students uh, or different gender students from playing in certain sports or from have, getting the medical attention that they need in schools. Uh, it also talks about the veto override of um, women and girls sports. And this attempt to change certain codes, building codes in North Carolina, um, some of which that have been in effect for a long time for certain reasons, is going to impact North Carolina's eligibility for future FEMA funding. They know that each and every single time a hurricane comes, it comes and impacts our black communities and our black counties and our black parts of the state more. And the way that they are looking at these regulation codes and working with these insurance agents can make it even more harder to get the funding that we need to rebuild our communities. The last thing I'm, I'm going to share with you is information around the state budget. Right now, the state budget has been delayed by over four months. Uh, I, to, right now, as soon as we leave from here, we're going to go down to the Viking Classic. That is the historic matchup between Elizabeth City State and I think this year, they're playing St. Augustine. They can't even hire all the staff that they need in the school because we don't have a state budget. In the middle of the year, in the middle of this summer, they had to push for students to be considered essential workers just so they could hire the student staff that they needed at the beginning of the year to get the dorms ready and to get the all resident assistance in the buildings. This state budget also impacts our cost of living adjustment for our retirees and individuals that expect that annual cost of living adjustment. And more importantly, they're putting elements in the budget that are going to impact us a lot more than what we realize. More notably, this last piece here. If this state budget is passed and it's supposed to be passed next week, it is going to shift the control of appointments to what's called the Judicial Standards Commission. Now, why is the Judicial Standards Commission important? This woman right here. Justice Anita Earls is currently the only black woman on the North Carolina Supreme Court. And as of this week, the only black person on the state Supreme Court. She is having to sue the Judicial Standards Commission because of the harassment that she's facing by being denied her First Amendment rights. There was a news article that came out documenting the number of racist acts that are happening in the judicial system. And they asked Justice Earls to comment on whether or not she saw any racism in the judicial system, and she commented on her opinion on what she saw. And the Republicans didn't like it. And so they are using this commission to get her out of office. Now, this is important for various reasons, and I don't have to tell this group, but there are organizations already that are standing up and defending Justice Earls, and a lot of these organizations are not just your typical democracy organizations. The AME Zion Church, uh, the General Baptist State Convention, the North Carolina NAACP, the Legislative Black Caucus, along with various other social justice organizations are stepping up and making sure the general public understands what it means to have a black woman on the state Supreme Court. Now, we have a black woman as vice president of the United States. We have a black woman in ma in making history as the vice president. Uh, I see uh, Lamisha Whittington on the call. Uh, me and her had the pleasure about three years ago to meet Kamala Harris while she was campaigning right in Raleigh, North Carolina. Katanji Brown Jackson, the first black woman Supreme Court justice. Our sister Fannie Willis is holding the line after the January 6th hearings, making sure that the country democracy doesn't fall into shambles. And then we have Justice Anita Earls. These black women are on the front lines protecting our right to live and breathe and exist in this country. And it is our duty to make sure that we're stepping up and protecting them right now. We're not talking. That's right, Miss Bay. I mean, it's the truth. When you see the fact that we are still arguing about 
women's access to leadership in the church, women's access to leadership in education. The same individuals that are come in and vote for a Republican for governor are not just voting because they care about Republican issues. They have a problem with black women in leadership positions. But if it wasn't for black women in leadership positions, I don't even know if we would have an East North Carolina Civic Group. I'm going to just be honest with you. So what we need to do is make sure everybody is not going to have the chance to get this download and go through all these bills. They want to know why I need to vote. We got to vote to protect black women. They need to know what's at stake. Black women are at stake. Our education is at stake. Our reproductive justice is at stake. And I really am going to be dependent upon Miss Betty and this group of leaders to continue this fight. And we want to make sure that we stand committed. And I want to thank Mr. Matthew to one of the slides yeah. that we haven't seen here that I think is very important is the work that we've done around trying to make sure the agricultural industry is expanding at a level in which it will be fair for our residents. And we think about the fact that they will make products and then 10 years later we'll get in the, in the back door trying to make some money. The opportunities that we have around hemp, the opportunities that we have around this legalization of something that's not a drug, it's actually a medicine that has been proven scientifically time and time again to help. We think about what could happen in this part of the state if we were able to make use of that type of technology, and we have it from the school to the farm right here. And I want to thank you, Mr. Matthews, and I want to thank Ms. Matthews for going, spending half of your summer going back and forth with us up to that General Assembly to make sure we made a difference, and the fight is not over. And I thank the Civic Group for what you're doing. I look forward to working with you all in the future. Any questions you may have, I'll be glad to answer them. And uh, we have the handout about the changes to voter ID. When voters go to the polls now, they're going to need to make sure they know about these changes um, because it's going to impact whether or not their vote counts. So I'll be glad to answer any questions and, and give this all to you on our way out. And thank you for dealing with my little sleepy little He's assistant right good. here. What? <laughs> you Mr. Hamm. Yes, sir. Yes, so, um, and I'm glad you made that distinction. So there, let's look at this as three different designations. You have public schools, what you know is our traditional public schools, the schools that we went to K through 12. Uh, those are mandated by the state constitution as being able to provide a fair and equitable education to every student. You, after your public schools, you have something that is called a charter school. Now, charter schools state that they are not public schools, but it doesn't mean that they're not open to the public. Some charter schools can operate just like a public school. The only difference is they're, they don't have to follow the rule of the LEA in that county. Every school county has a district LEA, the Board of Education. The charter schools don't have to fall under that Board of Education, and they're not falling under the regulation of the state. And they're not supposed to receive state funds, but the General Assembly has started making it to where charter schools can receive funding. Now, we know that the majority of black students in North Carolina attend public schools. And we've seen the white flight that has happened over the past several years from white teachers leaving the schools. They don't want to teach our babies. They want to criminalize them. They have created this charter school system now that has the ability to receive money from the General Assembly to exist. And they have no regulation. They can regulate public schools all day long. But whenever they give these monies to the charter schools, there's very little they can do if the charter schools waste the money. They have been documented schools right here in North Carolina where... They've looked in, and the school has gotten $250,000 from the state of North Carolina, and there may be 10 students in the school. Or they may be getting free and reduced lunch money from the federal government, and they look in the school system, and, you know, there's only four or five students in the school. These are for-profit entities trying to operate as public schools in our backyards, and they're using the guise of race to come in and say that the public schools are not educating students properly, and they can do a better job. But there is no regulation over these charter schools, and a lot of them will fly by night. Now, you do have some private schools that are charter and private schools where they're not receiving as the same level of funding, and they also won't allow all students to come into those schools. Those are your Christian academies and some of your other schools and institutions of that nature. So you have your public schools, your public charter schools, and you have your private charter schools. Okay, thank you. 
Mr. Bass, for all that good information. Are there any more questions? Anyone on have a question for Mr. Bass? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bass, for all that wonderful information. And we'll look to get the information from you uh, so we can distribute it among our members. And we're glad you're working with us, and we want to continue to work with you and Ms. Betty uh, and Mr. Matthew so we can be sure that we represent the people from Eastern North Carolina in every way possible. On the other side, um, what I wanted to pre to present to you today, um, the Black Alliance is having a volunteer recruitment going on. We have that going on. We're making phone calls, and what we're trying to do on um, this side on this side is to recruit volunteers, and we don't want just volunteers. We want to pay you are paid volunteers. We've been making calls requesting our, um, to get paid volunteers and what the paid volunteers will do is things such as canvassing, going door to door and dropping literature, letting people know who we are. And I wanted to remind you that the literature and the campaign that we have going on for volunteer recruitment is nonpartisan. We're just asking you to let us pay you to volunteer to get the word out, get our information out about voting. Not just canvassing that we have that we pay. Canvassers, we're paying $20 an hour um, for two canvas. You have to have two people because of safety. is two people that go. We also have um, phone banking. If you're interested in volunteer volunteering, and again, I stress paid volunteering, please go to ncblackalliance.org or give me your information today and I'll register you for the trainings. So please, ncblackalliance.org and we will be paying volunteers. We want to hit every door we can. We want to call everybody we can. We need for our people, for us, to get out there during this municipal election because what we do now um, is preparing us for 2024. Hold the shirt up, We are going to make sure everyone in the Civic Group receives one of these shirts. Um, and uh, you can see on the front it says way, Building Black Power. Back in this way. Back in this way. And uh, everybody here will get one. We also have enough handouts of the information I shared so you can pass that around too. So everybody will get a shirt and uh, the ability to have uh, some more of those handouts. Thank you, Mr. Bass, for those, uh, for all the information. Thank you, Ms. Betty. Um, we will make sure we get volunteers to work with you on this upcoming uh, vendor because uh, this upcoming election on the municipalities because um, that's a very important election also. Okay, are there any more questions? If not, we're going to move on to unfinished business. Oh, before I go, it's... Secretary Brown, did she ever come on? Secretary Brown? I see her name on the screen. Her name is on the screen. Okay, Secretary Brown, it's your time to come and provide us with your updates. I see. I think both of us grabbing our phones. Can you check and make sure that Secretary Brown is, is on? Somebody said she was on, but I don't. I can't see it. Yeah, I can see it now. Secretary Brown. She's unmuted. She might be away from. Like 
May I stop it for a moment while we're waiting on her? Yes, sir, Mr. Greer. I think I have to uh, I know that I have no He's got a message in the chat for you. We hey, will you ask Miss Miss Sampson to mute? Huh? Ask Miss Sampson to mute. Miss Sampson, will you please mute yourself? <laughs> that ain't so much I got to get most people. Miss Sampson, can you mute your your phone or your computer? Okay. Okay, Mr. Graham. Well, I was just alerting Moses that I have a message in the uh, chat. Yeah. Yeah, he can have that information. He'll give you a call. Good. Okay. Yeah, I was just alerting Moses that I have a message in the chat. Secretary Bryant. Okay, uh, Secretary Bryant, since you all are away, we're going to go ahead on to our next business and we'll come back to you. And that is the third reading of our bylaws, so we can go ahead on and get them uh, approved today. And so, uh, between Ms. Betty and Mr. Mo, they will read the uh, the bylaws for today. So, Mr. Mo, you can start getting at Ms. Betty. The whole yeah, the whole bylaws. It's all right on that screen. Section one name the name of the organization shall be the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group. The Eastern North Carolina Civic Group here and after shall be referred to as the group, ENCCG and the general body. Section two address the address of the organization shall be determined by the executive committee. Section three. Function and purpose. The function and purpose of the ENCCG shall be to provide equal opportunities for African Americans, minorities, and poor people to participate in political, social, and economic processes of government through a permanent committee structure appointed by the President. Article 2 Objective. Section 1 Objective. The objective of the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group, ENCCG, shall be to provide an organizational structure or system for African Americans, minorities, and poor people. Encourage, promote, and involve members in all facets of government. Provide a district forum associated with issues and concerns that affect members. Create a communication network with existing human rights and civil rights organizations. Assist counties within the district structure with their plans strategies and programs and create a monitoring system at the local, state, national, and international levels of government. Section 2, counties of the civic group. The following counties constitute the membership of the civic group. Beaufort, Bertie, Camden, Carteret, Swan, Craven, Curtuff, Deer, Edgecombe, Gates, Green, Halifax, Burford, Hyde, the North, Martin, Northampton, Pamlico, Pasquotank, Perquimans, Pitt, Terrell, and Washington. Article 3, Meetings. Section 1, Place and Time. Regular meetings and special meetings of the members should be called and held at such place and at such time as the executive committee shall authorize. A, the regular meetings shall be held on dates established by the executive committee and approved by the general 
bodies. Meeting of the meeting of the executive committee should be held in conjunction with what prior to the regular meeting. C. Special meetings shall be called by a majority of the executive committee. Section two. Notice of meetings. Written notices. Written notice of all meetings shall be mailed or emailed to each member of not less than seven days or not more than 30 days before the date set for any such meeting. Notices may not be required of duly established meeting times and places as agreed by the general body. All notices of any special meeting shall state the purpose of the meeting. Section 3, Record of County Leadership Members. The roster of the organization shall include a current list of all five district representatives, name and address as provided by the member to the secretary. Section 4, Forum. A quorum at all meetings of the members shall consist of the actual present of one-third of the county members eligible to vote. If less than a quorum is, is present, a majority of the voting members present may adjourn the meeting without further notice. Voting members represented at a duly organized meeting may, const may continue to transact business until the meeting is adjourned even if withdrawals or departures of members result in the presence of less than quorum. Section 5, voting. Except where otherwise stated all matters brought to a vote at meeting, at, at meeting shall be decided by a simple majority of the counties present, and voting providing that a quorum is present. The presiding office, officer shall have the same voting status as other members. Section 6, Proxies. There should be no voting by proxy at meetings of the members. Section 7, Members. Membership shall be limited to those persons who support and participate in the goals, objectives, and ideals of the organization. County membership will be achieved by paying an assessment of $100 annually. If full paid county will be accessed one vote in matters before the body. A $10 membership fee is available to persons whose county does not pay the $100 assessment fee. Individual members will be entitled to one-tenth of a vote on matters that come before the body. The county or individual's individual assessment fee shall be paid by April 1 of each year. Section 1, Officers. The officers of the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group shall consist of a president, three, vice president, a secretary, and assistant secretary. A treasurer and other officers of the elected community may elect from time to time. <coughs> Election and term. The officers of the Civic Group shall be elected by general membership. Each county will have one vote. Such election will be held in September of odd number years. The term of the office shall be two years. Each officer shall be eligible to hold for two consecutive years, two consecutive terms. Therefore, the officer cannot serve until the completion of one vacant term. President, the president, president shall be the chief executive officer of the civic group the president shall supervise and control the management of the civic group in accordance with these bylaws. The president shall preside at meetings of members and act as the chairman of the executive committee. The president shall sign with other officers any instruments on behalf of the civic group as may be required or permitted by law. In general, the 
president shall perform all duties that are incident to the office and other duties as defined by the executive committee. Between meetings of the general body, the president is authorized to exercise general executive authority on behalf of the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group. Subject ratification by the executive committee and or the general body. The president is to perform such other functions and exercise such as duties as may be voted from time to time by the general body or the executive committee. The president is authorized to appoint commit chairpersons subject to approval of the general body or the executive board. Section 4, vice president, in the absence of the president or in an event of death, inability, or refusal to act, the vice president is the order of the numer numerical rank, unless otherwise determined by the executive committee, shall perform the duties of the president. When so acting, the vice president shall have all the powers of and be subject to all the restrictions of the president. Any vice president shall perform other duties as assigned by the president and the executive committee. Secretary. The secretary shall keep accurate records of the proceedings of all meetings. The secretary shall, say, make, shall maintain a listing of all standing committees, the officers and members of the of the committees, and the mission statement shall be in charge of the committee. The secretary shall give notice of all meetings as required by these bylaws. The secretary shall turn over all records and other proceedings. What screen moving? All all proceedings to the assistant secretary upon resignation, inability or refusal to act, and upon any other vacancy. The secretary will accomplish other duties as signed by the president and the executive board. Assistant secretary. In the absence of the secretary or in the event of death, inability, or refusing to act, the assistant secretary will perform all duties of the secretary. When so acting, the assistant se secretary shall have the powers of and be subject to all the restrictions of the secretary. The assistant secretary shall perform other duties assigned by the president and executive board. Correct. Churches shall have custody of all funds and securities belonging to the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group, receive deposits, and disperse the same under the directions of the Executive Committee. The Treasurer shall keep full and accurate accounts of the financing of the Civic Group. The Treasurer will provide reports to the Civic Group every two months. The financial records will be available for review by the Executive Committee upon request. The Treasury will provide all annual reports and statements of financial status to the Civic Group. The Treasury will accomplish other duties as assigned by the President and the Executive Committee upon approval of the General Body. Committees. Executive Committee. The Executive Committee shall have general control of, all, of the affairs and program of the Eastern Civic Group subject to the authority of the General Body and provision of the approved by bylaw. The Executive Committee shall render a report containing the report of the standing of the Special Committee and the regular meeting rule of the General Body. The Executive Committee shall act as directed by the General Body. The Executive Committee shall be empowered to act in the absence of the General Body. The Executive Committee shall report all actions to the body at the next regular meeting or special call meeting as it occurs. The Executive Committee shall compose of the duly elected officers of the East Mississippi Standing Committee. There are five standing committees of Eastern Carolina, Eastern North Carolina Civic Group. The Committee of the Bylaws, Election Committee, Nominating and Operating Procedures. This committee is in charge of the duties and responsibilities of reporting on all changes to the bylaws and such amendments to the general body with such sufficient <coughs> notice given no less than 30 days prior to the changing of the bylaws. Likewise, the committee is in charge with giving notice of any changes in the operating procedures of the general body. The, com the committee is also in charge of creating rules and regulations of all nominations of persons for the various offices of 
piece of silk thread. During unnumbered years, this committee is charged with creating a slate of officers for election at least 90 days prior to the September election date, as set in other provisions in these bylaws. The committee shall have other such duty as deemed necessary by the general committee. The Committee of Economic Development. The Committee of Economic Development shall implement local efforts and support programs to preserve and expand economic empowerment among the black and brown minority citizens of Eastern North Carolina. The committee shall engage in other duties, functions, and responsibility as necessary to implement economic development to its constituents. The Committee of Finance. The committee shall plan and conduct fundraising activities, budgets, and financial operations to the general body. These two committees shall have such other duties, function, and responsibility approved by the general body. The Committee on Political Action. The Committee on Political Action is in charge of creating methods to increase participation of black and brown minority citizens in the electoral process and in government operations at the local, state, and national level. The Committee in, so in Social Welfare. The committee shall implement social actions and social welfare policy and procedures of the general body. The committee shall have other duties and responsibility approved by the general body. Ad hoc committee. The ad hoc committee shall be appointed to research, review, and report on matters of concern of the century. Shall person of the ad hoc committee shall be appointed and serve at the pleasure of the president. Regional organization, section one. Regions of the Civic Group. The counties of the Civic Group are divided into the following. Northwest Region, five counties. Bertie, Halifax, Hertford, Mark, Northampton. Northeast Regions, six. That was the Northwest. North, Northeast Region, six counties. Camden, Chowan, Curry, Upgate, Papatock, Clements. Central East Region, Four counties, Dare, High, Terrell, and Washington. Central West Region, four counties, Beaufort, Edgecombe, Green, and Pitt. Southern Region, four counties, Carteret, Craven, Lenore, and Pamlico. By bylaws, by bylaws may be amended by a two thirds vote of the general body. All proposed amendments to the general body shall be presented at least 30 days prior to duly called meeting and a regular meeting provided. Therefore, duly and proper prior notice be given. Upon a motion, these are the bylaws approved approval. Upon a motion made by the chair of the bylaw committee, the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group duly adopts and approves these bylaws. Uh, is it ready for approval? Yes. I want to look at did we change a lot of um, language where we said um, black people? We I had a I'm trying to look for it. Yeah, section three, function and purpose. The function and purpose of the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group shall be provided equal opportunities for African American, minority, and poor people. The original one that was done in the 60s, said the function and purpose of the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group shall provide equal opportunity. And it got black. African American was not in there. And um, that wasn't original. That wasn't the original. Uh, did I mess it up? No, you got it. Okay. That wasn't the original, original language. And it was based on they uh, they didn't use the term that's I use the term African America, African America. Um, we came up with that, but I like to see the original bylaws um, use black, use black, um, yeah, and not African American. Um, so, uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Pre Vice President. Um, both of y'all, I'd like to see that language change back. Um, so I understand you correctly. You want to change the wording from African.
African America back to black. That's what the founders said, named it. Okay. That's whose shoulders that we're standing on. Um, I know we changed some things, but I think that's key and I think that's important. In the 60s, they didn't say African American, they said black. And so, uh, if I'm understanding you right, we need to take this back to the committee and let them make the necessary change before we vote on it, or do they need to get together and discuss it? Um, whatever pleasure is. Mr. Matthews, what's your thought about changing African America back to black? Mm -hmm. Or anybody else? Discussion. Discussion. Since we are in 
I see you got your hand up, Secretary Brian. Somebody else trying to talk. Oh, who else was speaking? Somebody else was speaking. What was your uh, your information or your comment? Somebody else was speaking. Somebody else was speaking. Somebody else was speaking. Somebody else was speaking. Okay, so. Yes, sir. Um, so, what way do we take it back? What we're going to do is go back to committee, we're going to go back and look at either black slash African American or just pure black. So we're going to do that. The committee is going to think about that, whatever. Then we'll make those changes and bring it back before the committee, or before the full body on our next meeting in October. Okay. Any more discussion? Ms. May? Okay. okay, so we. Yes, sir. Yes, that's what her point was. Was based on the on the founders, but we have a new generation of people that identify about African American. So we can go back and decide what. Uh, do we want this because we made the changes? So then we'll go back and say, this is what was brought to our attention at our third reading. So let's go back and decide which way we want to come back. And the exact committee, along with the bylaw, will discuss everything and then we'll bring back uh, the final results of that. I'm saying, but I want it to be based on the founders, not yeah. just what's going on today. Right. Make we understand that. Uh, we understand that. Because I got a problem. We understand. We understand it, but we got to care about it for the community. Let them uh, put in the, with the make the decision to come out with a new, with an, uh, with the correct language in that particular session, session three on the on the article one. Okay, there any more discussion? If not, we're going to. Uh, put off the vote on the bylaws until our October meeting. So at this time, Secretary Bryan, if you're ready to give your report, uh, we would like to have you now. Um, thank you, and I, I apologize if I was confused anything. I didn't make to hear that whole discussion. And it's important for you to know that lots of groups are having this conversation, you know, about uh, um, black African-American people of color, BIPOC, I mean, there's a whole list, and, and there are pros and cons to everything. And um, uh, so I uh, just continue, you know, the issue is the purpose, and you can always state what your history is and what your focus is, and then have a statement about additional language that would maybe, you know, be inclusive of others or something. But so much on that subject. Uh, my update on uh, Health and Human Services. My name is Angela Bryant. If there's anyone new who is attending, hope there's somebody who is attending. And anybody new on the call, I am an assistant secretary for the Health Equity Portfolio at North Carolina DHHS. And we have a couple of things I think that are important this week. The first is to let you know, I think to just give you an update on Medicaid expansion. And to let you know that we thought we were going to have a start date, a budget by September 1st, and a start date of October 1st. As you know, if you're following the news, we don't have that budget yet. We think, we're thinking we will get the first look at that budget next week. By the time it goes through the processes, it may be more productive if it gets ratified by the end of the month. That depends on if the governor signs it. That is fine, it details it, you know, all of what happened uh, in that process. So just keep your eyes peeled for that. But whenever it gets ratified, whenever the final action is had on the budget, um, then from that date, you can start officially uh, the countdown for Medicaid expansion. And it takes us a certain amount of time from that date, official date, legally, to launch. 
and Oakland Medicaid is rolling to the new expansion population. Um, it's looking like that might be December first. If we're lucky, and a bunch of you know dominoes fall in place, it may be November first. We aren't really giving a date. I'm just telling you all this. We're saying we are now at the point where we need to wait for this budget to see what may be possible. I think I reviewed with you all previously about Medicaid expansion. It's covering adults from 19 to 64, 138% uh, of poverty. So that moving up the um, uh, income level where it was, where an individual would have to make $8,000 as a maximum to be considered. Now it will move up to 19 or you know, nineteen thousand, almost maybe twenty thousand dollars for an individual, thirty four some thousand dollars for a couple, and then um, forty some thousand dollars for a parent and a child, or one parent for two people, parent and child, and a couple, and then um, for three people, um, you know, up to forty thousand, etc. And I can get that information email out to you all. Um, I, 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 I think I did show slides last time. I didn't want to um, uh, review that same information this time, but I can get that information out for you all. There will be ways to sign up um, uh, on, online as well as in your local DSS office, as well as in your local libraries and other community locations for signing up. We also will have what is called enrollment ambassadors. So I will get ready information to reach out to you to find out if it's any of your organization you want to train people to be enrollment ambassadors. And, and uh, there may be some foundation funding or something available for enrollment ambassadors. We aren't clear as to whether we'll have any direct statement for um, enrollment ambassadors. Uh, that at a certain point, and it takes us so many days. Our Medicaid expansion will be on the Affordable Care Act uh, site. So when we get on the Federal Care Act site, then it brings all of the structure of the Affordable Care Act to uh, bear on our Medicaid expansion population. And we will, um, and they will have all kinds of ways of outreaching. And providing you and know, helping people understand where you can get insurance from the expansion to the Affordable Care Act uh, for you. Uh, I take the keyboard. Can you all hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. There are three populations to be aware of. Uh, one population is there are people already on what's called family planning Medicaid, 300 some thousand people that will automatically be switched to Medicaid expansion. So they don't be switched automatically. It'll just happen in the computer on day one. So there are 300,000 people that will get full coverage versus the family planning services. They'll get full coverage on day one. On day, the second group is there are people who had uh, Medicaid during COVID because we didn't uh, we certify people we let people stay on Medicaid during COVID because we didn't want them without health care. But that ended in April, so some of those people would now be eligible for the expansion group we'll charge at that group. And then there'll be a new group of people who never tried Medicaid. They perhaps never tried other insurance or had or just in the gap. And we'll need your help identifying uh, those people. And a lot of these, because of the new income level, a significant amount of that population will be people who are working in jobs that pay nine, ten, and twelve, uh, depending on the size of their families, paying in those hourly ranges. Uh, will be um, eligible for Medicaid. So be thinking about that as you look at people in your family and your community. So I want to stop right there and see if, if there are any questions on Medicaid expansion. And then I, I want to talk about fall respiratory virus season for a minute. Any questions for me about our Medicaid expansion? Are there any questions? We don't have any, uh, Secretary Brown. Okay. You can continue. Okay. So, 
Thank you. The next thing we are emphasizing right at this time is asking everyone to get prepared for fall respiratory virus season. As you know, um, we have had increases in our COVID-19 measurements or tracking over the recent uh, week, and that was expected to be happening as we move into fall uh, the respiratory virus season. Um, we often expect peaks in the flu and other respiratory infections in the December to February period, but since the advent of COVID, we found that these respiratory viruses all seem to peak beginning in this September, October framework. Um, the good news is we now, uh, contrary to where we were even, say, a year ago, we have we now have two up-to-date tools in place to address all of these um, fall respiratory viruses. So the first thing is we are encouraging you to do several things. Uh, first of all, to make sure your COVID vaccines are up-to-date. Next week, a new COVID updated COVID vaccine is going to be uh, announced. Uh, if you think it will be available to all age groups, but we won't know that for sure until it gets announced to see what the recommendations are. And so we recommend um, people get up to date COVID boosters, especially if you are in the at risk category of older chronic diseases. Uh, uh, immunocompromised conditions, working with the people, uh, living with people in those at-risk at, uh, in those at-risk areas, we surely recommend you uh, getting an updated vaccine. If you've never gotten a vaccine, but with somebody asked you last month, you, you will start with this updated booster uh, vaccine. The other thing to know about vaccines is they are now commercialized commercialized during COVID, the government distributed this vaccine. But now these vaccines are commercialized and are on the private market. So they, you will get COVID vaccines now like you get every other vaccine. Most people, you can get them at the pharmacy, you can get them at your doctor's office, you can get them at the health department, uh, or you can get them at community health centers. Uh, but we will not be having mass vaccines uh, events like we had during COVID when the government controlled the supply of the vaccine. We'll have a limited supply of vaccines for bridge programs where there are uninsured folks, for example, who are not getting access, we be track, trying to track access as best we can, but we won't control vaccines uh, like we were used to during COVID. So we're going to have to use the regular mechanism, the regular um, uh, sources of uh, your vaccines and health care to get these um, COVID vaccines. Now, of course, you can always let us know at DHHS if you're having trouble. Uh, uh, and we will have uh, vaccine finders information on our website. We already have it on how to get uh, up to date COVID vaccines. And we'll get the new vaccine information. We're expecting to have that next week. And we'll be emailing your group, you know, working through vetting to make sure we get emails to you about the latest information. We, we're asking people to go on and get their seasonal flu vaccine now in September or October. Um, everybody six months and older should get a flu vaccine every year that is re recommended, again, especially people at high risk. There is this new vaccine now available for something called RSV, which is respiratory syncytial virus. And uh, we recommend that people talk 60 years and older and infants are the focus of the group for this virus, at risk for this virus. Talk to your doctor about whether this vaccine might be good for you and then uh, follow your doctor's instructions. In addition to the vaccines, we are recommending the following, that, um, that you be prepared to test yourself and seek treatment if you get symptoms or you are around somebody with symptoms. Have a ready supply of COVID-19 tests that's in your home and know how to use those tests so you can test yourself and your family members and get treatment if you test positive. There are treatments available for both COVID uh, infection and the flu that can uh, reduce your risk of hospitalization and death. If you're having symptoms, 
We are recommending that you contact your health provider, that you don't dilly dally along with symptoms and let them get worse. Because some of the treatments require you to get treatment within five or six days of your having symptoms. So you are seven that different for different uh, treatments. So you want to uh, reach out to your um, health care provider if you're having symptoms, and there are also medications that can be uh, prescribed to treat flu-like illness. We don't recommend that you let yourself get uh, seriously ill from uh, these respiratory viruses or flu-like symptoms, especially if you are, have asthma, diabetes, heart disease, pregnancy, or other uh, uh, serious chronic illnesses. Um, and, and of course, we want you to pack practice your, to bring back your basic uh, protective measures that you learned during COVID, washing your hands. This is the time of the year to focus on that, keeping your hands clean, get that sound time, go back in your pockets and pocketbooks and in your offices and meetings, like you're having today when people come in, cover your nose and mouth with your, the corner of your arm, when you're coughing or sneezing, clean surfaces often, and when you're sick, just stay home. Are uh, feeling good, stay home. Masks are still uh, very important, especially in indoor settings, high risk indoor settings, with lots of people, or if you're trying to protect people who are at risk. Uh, we will be maintaining our respiratory virus dashboard that will provide up to date information on the respiratory virus activity, including, including COVID influenza and RSV in the state. And we want to make sure that parents of infants, please talk to your child's doctor about new medications that can prevent uh, RSV infection. In addition, uh, there are treatments for infants for many of these infections. You want to be aware and on top of that. Also, the vaccine for children, COVID-19, now that it's commercialized, is a part of the vaccine for children program that's covered by Medicaid. And, uh, and children who are uninsured and underinsured have access to vaccines through this program. You will contact your health department, um, uh, uh, community health center, etc., for information about getting those vaccines for your children. So I will stop there and see if you, and, and for the rest, most people, 58% of us or so get our vaccines from pharmacies. The last updated COVID booster, though, only 25% of the population took advantage of that last updated booster. It would surely be helpful if we can increase that number for this fall season. Viruses. I'll stop here and take any questions. And I stopped heard it. I wasn't on camera. Uh, to check you off this evening, I was so busy trying to pay attention to what I was doing. Okay, Doc, are there any questions? Here at the meeting, or anyone on? Um, okay, we got one question for you, Secretary Bryant. I think I got a little bit confused. So, the vaccine that's coming out next is it a vaccine coming out next week? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So, updated, an updated COVID vaccine. It's, it's going to be called the twenty three twenty four COVID vaccine. So, like, I haven't had my third booster, so I should wait wait, you, wait for this one. You would get, no, yeah, you would wait for this, you would get this. Okay. And, and like the flu vaccine, it's updated for what they uh, expect to be the current strain of the COVID vaccine. So. Okay, I'll so end are there any more questions? Yes, Ms. Sim, Ms. Barbara Sampson. Yes, Barbara. Uh, yes, I, I, I know that they were saying that um, COVID and stuff was um, a new strain was coming back and stuff. But on uh, the health department, so they're going to be giving out uh, masks and gloves or anything like that. You know, and sanitary uh -huh. stuff to protect yourself. Uh, we aren't distributing that through the uh, DHHS as I know at this time. But sometimes that comes, you know, up, and I don't know it until I get the information of which I'll let you know. But I would say that would be by health department. Each health department would have that have to have their own plan for that. And some departments probably have 
uh, those that equipment on hand from the from the pandemic period. But we aren't giving out at state level uh, anymore. All right, thank you. Yeah, we did have a limited amount of tests available for organizations to receive, and that's on our website. Now, I don't know if any of those tests are still available or not, but we did have some free tests recently, and you had to fill out a form on the line. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. You don't got to know. I'm just checking. Ask them for some other people that I know you have to make my meat on. Yeah, but gloves and sanitizer and all of that is important. You're right. Right. We won't have that. We won't have that like we did during COVID, for sure. You know, during the pandemic period. Uh, what, what they call the health emergency, the public health emergency. But I would say check with your local health department and other community health organizations. You know, we had a series, a whole um, array of 60 some community based organizations that we planned during the COVID pandemic. It called Healthier Together. So check with them. Uh, they should, they probably have supplies on hand. I think in the Northeast, ABC2 out of Halifax County, Chester Williams, and their organization was one of those groups. Uh, they might, they, I'm sure they could direct you. And the, um, Community Health Access East, which is, uh, one of the, uh, uh, Healthy Opportunity Network leads, uh, the Medicaid, either one of those organizations should be able to connect you. To protective equipment as well as a test, as well as test. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any more questions for Secretary Bryan? If not, thank you, Secretary Bryan, for all that important information that you provided for us today. And we want you to continue to be with us and all our meetings to give us the update. Again, I say thank you. I will continue. I want to thank Camilla Dancy, who is my uh, uh, civic group whisperer, and keeps me on the case. So thank you, Camilla. The other thing I want to ask is, are you all getting emails from my office? I just want to know if I'm if you're being effective since sending out those emails. Yes, yes we get your email. Okay. Yes, we get them. Okay. Thank you. And thank okay. you. Uh, let me know if you need anything. Thank you so much. Uh, we will. And thank you again for all your important information. Okay. Um, at this time, we have come almost down to the end of our uh, business that we got to take care of. There's no more old business. The new business will be um, Justice Anita Earl's support. Uh, we got a got a request that the civic group support uh, Justice. Earl on what's going on with her to so stand with her at this time while everybody else is trying to knock her down. Uh, so I'm asking the, the civic group today Make a motion that we support to, Earl. yeah, I want a motion. You made a motion, made a motion. No. it's been motion, it's been proper motion and second that we support second. just the uh, Anita Earl on her whatever her issue that she had with the. Uh, Justice Department. So we're going to write a letter. The president going to write a letter to sing and support her on her journey and be sure she remains in office. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, man, Mr. Vice Chair, I think the, the uh, number good step after is to encourage all the members in the civic group, from your church or whatever organization you have, to follow the civic group lead. Whatever the letter comes out, making sure that you we can share it with our other organizations so they can either endorse the statement or make their own statement. But this is going to be a powerful tool when it was by Okay. We will do that. Any more discussion? All in favor of the motion has been known by saying aye. aye. Those opposed likewise. The ayes have it so we will be writing a letter to support Justice Anita Earls. Uh, this time I see that brother, that our president, Mr. Weston Stokes, is on. Mr. Stokes, do you have anything you want to say at this time? Um, meet yourself, Mr. Stokes. He might be in listening mode. Oh. I know he had a pill. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, all right. Um, are there any other announcements or anything? Uh, we will be doing the ladder, and we will get that out to everyone once we do the ladder. I have one announcement. Okay. Mr. Greer. Yes, sir, Mr. Greer. Thank you all. Um, I want to call something to your attention that you probably have an awareness of, and it is the fact that France is being kicked out of the African country of the Niger. And you're being kicked out because of the century of exploitation that has been going on in Africa by the European. There is a revolution taking place in Africa and we are being called upon to help fight against the current colonization that is still taking place in Africa. Um, and, and I obviously, on September 27th, uh, black people are being called upon worldwide to protest at French embassies that they have access to. And the organization that is uh, leading the demonstration and trying to help get France out of the other countries that they're exploiting in Africa is the African Diaspora Development Institute. I am the North Carolina chairperson. And the same fight that, that Marcus outlined during his presentation is a fight that black people are involved in worldwide and have been involved in it for centuries on top of centuries. So you know what it is, I won't have to get into any more real detail. But what I, uh, I'm going to do when I talk with, with the most is give them an update and uh, ask them to uh, help get it shared with the citizens of course. That is my, my contact, but we talk to more also, and, and maybe the three of us can get the information out to you. But there is a revolution going on in Africa, and it's about the economic liberation of black people worldwide. And we need to be a part of the fight. And so, with that being said, if there is a question, I'll take it. If not, I'll listen until the roll call and we'll discuss the way that we can go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Are there any other questions? If not, we have an announcement from Brother Mo. On October the 5th through the 7th, the, the North Carolina Caucus of Black School Board members are having their annual retreat and forum. And at the North Raleigh uh, Hotel in, in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. The theme this year is promoting inclusion, the courage to lead and inspire educational success. Uh, I, would, I would recommend that, that the Caucus of Black School Board members is, is a statewide organization, over 20 years old. Um, I, I would I would ask that that, that folks um, require each one of the local board of education to send somebody there. There, there are 100 counties in this in this state that, that has a LEA, a local education board, and and there are additional cities that have their school board. So uh, it would be very encouraging for all 100 counties to send a representative um, to this caucus and, and, and see what we can do to, to ensure safe passage and, and, and safety conditions and educational 
progress for our students. Uh, we had a uh, we, we had a state of peril. Um, Marcus talked about uh, the money side of it, and, and and we know that money matters. So uh, uh, that's that's October the fifth through the seventh. It's not and the deadline to try to get a uh, a discount on on all the activities of September the seventeenth. So uh, if you can. Call your local school board members. Call your local school board, and 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 find out what uh, involvement they are they are having in terms of participating in in, in this forum. Uh, you can go to your website, and that's www.nccbsbm.org. Um, if you can't get in touch with your your local school board. Uh, Again, that's www.nccbsbm.org. Thank you. I Real quickly, I wanted to let you know that next month we will be meeting in Elizabeth City. Um, Mayor uh, Rivers have not gave us a location, but we will be meeting there. Jeremy, thank you so much. Sorry for the communication. Uh, in November, we plan to meet in Craven County, so I'm letting you know. October, Elizabeth City. October 14, Elizabeth City. And then in November. November, we're not sure about the date because we're running into, what is it, is it Veterans Day? Yes. So that's on our second Saturday. And I'll close, I'll give it to uh, him with, don't forget, if you would like to be a paid volunteer with the Black Alliance, please go to ncblackalliance.org. We need your help. And as I was saying, it's a paid volunteer. We want to get out and get in the communities, and we could use your help. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, the last announcement I have is that uh, we want to keep Brother Sears in our prayers. Uh, he was one of the founders, or he worked with us at Dillington. He's been under the weather. He's still in the hospital in Elizabeth City. So let's pray for him that he get better so he can come home. Uh, that's Mr. James Sears. Uh, if you don't have his number, I understand that he can be, he can reach my phone. If not, you can't go visit him uh, at this time. Uh, with that being said, uh, Brother Stokes, Mr. Stokes, do you have anything you want to say before we we'll adjourn the meeting or anything else from anyone else on the line or here? Well, see, my Brother Stokes is not available at this time. Again, so uh, at this time, I will accept the motion to adjourn. It's been properly moved and second that we're adjourned. All in favor let me know by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed likewise. Ayes have it. So we are now adjourned this meeting of the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group. Thank you. Thank you everybody for attending. Have a good day, everybody. Have a good day, everybody. Yeah. You have a blessed day yourself. And thank you everybody for coming. Really appreciate it. I hope we did your honors today.